Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Dennis Lewicki and I'm with the Social Planning Council, one of the um, sponsors of the uh, event tonight. I'd like to welcome you all. Uh, the purpose of tonight is to get a better understanding of what the candidates for mayor think about our community and what they would like to do to improve our community. Now, I want to be clear, as we want the candidates to be clear, we're talking about community, not just city. By community, we mean the combination of people, the relationships between the people, the social infrastructure that brings us together, and the environment that gives us food, income, recreation, and warmth. Improving community is more than just fixing potholes, more than just putting pipes in the ground, and more than just putting police on the streets. We want to hear tonight inspiring leadership from our candidates, and I hope that we can also inspire them with our questions and what we're going to do after the election. In particular, we want to know how they are going to include everyone in the development of the community and how they will... Thank you, Sean. And we want to know how they're going to assure that there's going to be equity and integrity in government. Bravo. The city part of our discussion tonight is where the candidates will talk about how they will assure integrity in how the city operates. Um, we, we want to show how they will make City Hall accessible and responsive to us as citizens. We want to know their plans for improving the capacity of how city services are delivered. Now, we're going to run a very tight process so that there's lots of time for responses to the questions. And in particular, we want to listen for the commitments that the candidates are going to make in terms of community infrastructure, meeting the needs of people and our culture, meeting the needs of our environment. In particular, we'll also want to hear how they're going to make government accessible, accountable, and capable. On what we hear tonight, and what we read about the candidates and from the candidates, and what we hear from our neighbors, colleagues, and friends, we can then make an informed choice of who we will vote for. But remember, the election on the 22nd of October is not the end of the campaign to change Winnipeg. It's only the beginning of the next administration at City Hall, which will depend on all of us and our constant input. If you don't get to the microphone tonight, we will ask you to write out your questions and give them to us. Write them down, including comments and they will be given to the candidates and we will be recording any of the questions and answers and they will be posted on our website tomorrow morning so that everybody can have an opportunity to have their questions put forward and the candidates will be able to respond. In the two hours we've got, we will not be able to hear every candidate talk about every question. Uh, we're also taking notes and those will be posted as well. After tonight, Remember that the most important person in any election is you, the voter, you, the citizen. It's essential that everyone here get out to vote and that we tell others and get them out to vote on the basis of what you're hearing tonight and what the candidates are saying. After this election, with your support and constant input, we will continue to work with the mayor and council and build a city where equity is a consideration in all that is done at City Hall and that integrity is upheld in how we do it. I'd like to hand over now to Sean Cavanaugh, who I think you all know from CBC Television News. And uh, Janet Stewart was to be the moderator tonight, but unfortunately her mother passed away and she couldn't be here tonight, but Sean has stepped in. So I'll hand it over to Sean. Thank you. I'm going to do one thing, just bear with me here because I've been on the campaign trail a lot and I haven't done this yet. 
and, and realize that two of the candidates aren't here, but you ready guys? I'm going to do a quick photo bomb. <laughs> Be here tonight. Uh, Mr. Steve sent his uh, regrets, and Mr. Havixbeck didn't respond to the invitation. You can take that as you wish. Uh, it's a fascinating topic for reporters. We go everywhere in the city, from Royalwood to Manitoba <laughs> Avenue, from Tuxedo to Aikens. And so, community is something we see at a lot of different levels. So, I'm fascinated to hear what the candidates have to say tonight. Um, I'll give some, some guidelines here. Uh, I'd ask all of you to be direct and stay on time. Longer speeches are disrespectful, I'm told, to those who came here tonight and want to listen. So you're all going to get two minutes to speak on what equity means to you. How will you, as the mayor of the city, create more of an equitable city? And I'm going to draw your names out of a hat as to who goes first. I would ask all of you when we get to the question point, I've been with these folks many times over the last few months. I'd ask you to be respectful because they are, regardless of their politics or what they say, working incredibly hard. Knocking on doors, answering phone calls, staying up late at night. There is no doubt you can question their politics, but do not question their energy and commitment. So when you ask your questions, please ask them respectfully because they deserve that, as you do too. So here we go. I'm going to pull up the fabulous bowl of fun, and we're going to get to it. A two-minute, what does equity mean to you, and how will you as mayor of Winnipeg create a more equitable city? Here we go. Shake it up. Robert Falcon Alet, would you please go first? Thank you very much for having me here tonight and for listening to us. Um, equity. So, I remember when I was in the Canadian Forces, uh, at one point there was a, you had a certain type of people that was in the Canadian Forces. And eventually they decided if we're to be representative of Canadian society and Canadian values, we had to have everyone. Women, minorities, Aboriginal peoples, transgender, gay people, homosexual, uh, or uh, queer, transgender. And it was really important for us in order to represent Canadian values. And so this is what I would like to see more of at City Hall at, uh, in here in Winnipeg. I know I have a colleague of mine at the University of Manitoba, and she's a fantastic young lady. She uh, has a mental disability, yet every day that she comes to work, she brings cheer and joy to the workplace. And so in order, if we're going to create a more inclusive society, we have to have more people rubbing shoulders who have differences. And so this is what I would like to see more of at the City of Winnipeg. It's hiring. Because uh, Dr. Oleg didn't spend all of his time, it doesn't mean you all uh, get to take <laughs> extra time. Uh, that person isn't here. And that person isn't here, so we'll just toss those out. Mr. Philly, if you would go next. Okay. Good, good evening. Primarily, I would like to thank Christina Maynino for organizing this forum, and also Sean Kavanaugh for moderating this event. Equity. I would like to give my interpretation of this word with synonyms and keywords. Fair competition. Healthy communities. Decision making. Accountability. Equal playing field. Past, present, and future. Full potential. Access. Opportunity. When you install barriers on a highway, it is to prevent passage. The same is with humans. We prevent the participation of individuals in a society, therefore weakening the sense of entity, weakening the unit, weakening the body. The lack of barriers unifies the city. It makes the city as one. If I think of the, of the local situation in Winnipeg regarding equity, 
with the progression of the years, I see an accumulation division, especially between the north and the south. I need, as mayor, to unify the city so that the city thinks as one. In my film on YouTube that I was just posted this morning, I talk about unification, an idea that would not cost the city any money except for a prize, would be the creation of a unique and novel Winnipeg township, used by the Winnipeggers as they meet each other to identify themselves as such. It gives a sense of unity, it gives a sense of one. The job of mayor is to oversee the whole operation of the civic government. It is, in the most part, an administrative job. I have 30 years of experience in administration, therefore the most suited for this position. Living in a complete sense of equity is similar to the way that I was brought up on the farm. You see, some people think that I was raised too innocently. That's two minutes, you gotta wind it up. When I first moved to Winnipeg, well, let me tell you, it was quite the shock. But I learned how to deal with the detrimental ways in which people treat each other in order to reach for the top. Why I want to become mayor is to give to the citizens a little of this innocence that, is, that I still possess and to give it as a gift. Because living in innocence is a wonderful world. Equity, the whole, is greater than the sum of its parts. Thank you for your attention. Sorry. Hello everyone. <clears throat> uh, it is a pleasure to be home again. The last time I was in this room was to hear the final results of the work we had done to rebuild Flora Place, which is immediately north of this site. Uh, this is now some 13 years ago, I guess 12 years ago. Stick up, David. About 12 years ago, I had the privilege of working with the residents of Flora Place to save their community as an articling law student uh, from legal aid. And it was, to me, an example of what should be equity and integrity in our community where people work together to be fair and just to each other, to understand what people's needs were and their preferences, and to find ways of delivering the results that they wanted. And when we started, it looked like it was going to be impossible, but in the end, they had homes with gardens, they could keep their pets, uh, and those who, who stuck with it uh, had wonderful homes, and the rents that they paid were the same as the rents they paid in the older homes. That was, I think, a success all the way around, and in no small measure, due to the work of the residents themselves who made it happen. Anything I can do to support that kind of community development is to me what it means to be concerned with equity. And I'll talk about integrity later. Our next speaker is Mr. Bowman. Thank you very much. Uh, it's too bad the other candidates aren't here because I have a feeling we're going to learn a lot from this audience. It's great to see everybody here tonight and thank you so much for coming. Um, this election is about a lot more than just pipes and potholes. It's about pride and confidence in our community. And we can't just talk about it, we need to be able to act on it in order to give people a real sense of pride and greater confidence in our community. I'm going to just mention three quick experiences that I've had in my life that give me a deeper appreciation for the, the word equity. Um, I'm a social media lawyer, which means I help families affected by cyberbullying. I have learned firsthand that equity and inequities affect more than just the direct person who's affected, it affects families. The Manitoba Naturalist Society, I used to be a board member there, and one of the things I learned in that experience was generational equity. We would need to make sure we're protecting the environment for the next generation, for my children and yours. And lastly, through Gany Ganichuk, I'm AT, I helped out on the board there, I've learned about cultural equity. Now in terms of uh, the question, I see one Winnipeg, not North End, South End, uh, Aboriginal, non-Aboriginal business labor. We're one city, whoever sits in that seat in the office of the mayor after the next election has better, better have a good understanding of who we are as a community, as a whole. And I'll uh, look forward to talking about more specific policies before I get cut off. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you.
last but not least, Ms. Wasserman-Shalese. Thank you very, very much. And thanks to all the uh, members of City Watch who have made this possible tonight. Welcome to my neighborhood. I'm so glad you're all here. You're the best you then. And I want to begin by saying that all of my life in this community uh, has been either as a volunteer, or as a politician, or as a community activist, or a volunteer. And it's all been about working with you on your behalf wherever I can to achieve equality between peoples, for equality of condition and equality of opportunity. And that is the essence of what makes a vibrant city. It is truly about quality of life and equality of opportunity and condition. Where do we start? We start with the foundations of our city, and yes, we focus on potholes and, and pipes because, in fact, it's, it, we need to sometimes flush a toilet, and we need to be able to ride our bike to work, and we need to be able to enjoy a, a, a city that is functioning physically. But it's only, a, it's only the beginning of the whole dream of creating a city where everyone feels a part of it. And I believe equality and equity, as you've defined it, is about policies that ensure that our Aboriginal people are respected as equal partners, where people with disabilities are able to enjoy access to services and opportunities, where our youth are fully respected, where women are empowered to give the leadership that they're so able to provide for all of us, where all of us can learn to live together with respect and harmony. And I'm just going to end with a quote that has kept me strong in 30 seconds to paraphrase phrase, Danish urban planner John Gell, a great city is one where people want to go out of their homes, even in winter, where public space is a magical good and never ceases to yield pleasure, where public good prevails over private interests, where no one feels excluded. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to ask the candidates to sort out their desk space here and get their signs out. This is going to be fun, or it's going to be a disaster, one of the two. I'm pretty excited about it. I've been to a million of these things. This is the most innovative, participatory series of questions. And it's sort of like that game show, and I'm terrible with game shows. They, they, they kind of get a lifeline. I'll explain what's going to happen. We're going to ask some rapid fire questions. And the candidates are going to hold up their little signs and it's going to say yes or no, or they're going to hold up both if it's a maybe. When has a politician said to you, maybe? <laughs> Never happened to me. Never happened to me. Uh, they can also hold up this yellow card here and it's their answer card. They get three of these cards throughout the night. So three lifelines, if that's the reference to the game show that I remember. And if they give up the answer card, that means that they don't have a simple yes or no answer, and they'll explain what they mean. And I'll guess, because this is something of a dictatorship at this moment, because I've got the microphone, I'll determine how much time they get to explain. <laughs> so we're going to try and go through this, and we'll see. And I'm not going to be able to see the answers, but, you know, get involved. So don't heckle, but, you know, you like what you see. So here we go, you've got your cards, panelists. Green space and natural areas near where we live contribute to our well-being. It says here, the urban forest alone is valued at a billion dollars. That's an amount equal to the total amount of Winnipeg's operating budget. The lack of a master plan for our urban green space, space infrastructure is resulting in piecemeal consultation and planning in Winnipeg. Piecemeal consultation and planning. I don't believe that either. <laughs> Here's the question. Would you support the completion of a master green space plan for Winnipeg? Master green space plan. <laughs> so as we go through this, not only think about the answer in the moment, but think about it when you vote, and think about it when one of these people is in office. And remember, I was there. I was there that night when you said, Master Plan, Green Space, where is that plan? Second question. The City of Winnipeg purchases many goods and services that can be provided by social enterprises and cooperatives that use a business model to create community benefit, which creates jobs for people with barriers to employment, reduces poverty, provides community services, 
and builds a fairer and more sustainable local economy? Will you work to implement a procurement strategy that takes into account the added economic, social, and environmental value of purchasing from social enterprises and other businesses that generate a community benefit? So is that going to be part of the city's procurement plan? The plan. Candidates, what do you think? All green. The city council had a consensus like this would be a way to the races. cynical about that. <laughs> community engagement. Residents associations, community-based organizations, and other groups have found that the city of Winnipeg consults citizens inconsistently. And there's often no link between consultation and decision making. This is very familiar stuff to me. I don't know why. Will you commit to developing a community engagement strategy for the city of Winnipeg? Yes or no or maybe? An answer from Mr. Bowman, we'll get to that. The rest are all a yes. So, Mr. Bowman, you've used one of your lifelines, I believe, with this. Are we going to rip it up now? <laughs> uh, well, I, I'll keep track here on the podium. So, community engagement. Developing a community engagement strategy for the City of Winnipeg. Explain what you mean. Well, I'd like to expand, expand on the... Uh expand on uh, emphatical yes, but uh, what, one of my first commitments, the, the first commitment you may remember that I made at City Hall just after I announced my candidacy was to have a dedicated office of public engagement because I want to have dedicated personnel making sure that a public engagement with, with citizens across the community uh, are engaged from the ground up and throughout the implementation of policies, procedures, and, uh, and city efforts. So I'm going to hijack the process. So does that, does that mean 311, every, you know, if you go into the, the city clerk's office, like I've done almost 100 times this week, or, or somewhere, like, what are you talking about? Is it an office? Is it a phone number? What, what do you mean? It's, it's a staff. It's a phone number. It's an active social media campaign. It is using every available technology and tool to make sure citizens are engaged. One of the things for those of us that haven't spent a lifetime in, in, at City Hall and in politics is getting information during the election. And it's, as you know, it's difficult to get that information out of City Hall. It shouldn't be so difficult for candidates. It shouldn't be so difficult for citizens. And I want to make a specific commitment to have a new Office of Public Engagement with Winnipeg's support. So, didn't you hold up a green one? or? Was that my fault? I, 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 I don't know if there's a rebuttal. You can, <laughs> I don't know if there's a rebuttal, but you could use your answer on the next to rebut Mr. Bowman if you so desire. I think we're making up the rules. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like City Hall. It sounds like City Hall. I'll never be running for one in the office. Sprawl and development. Winnipeg's roads, sewers, and water lines, and its entire service network including community centers, police stations. Can you hear me? <laughs> police stations, street cleaning, snow removal, grass cutting, and set control traverse many undeveloped areas, including vast green fields like Transcona West, where taxes are minimal. At the same time, Winnipeg has an infrastructure deficit of over $7 billion. Here's your question. Will you commit yourself to ensuring that the city adopts a policy of refusing further extensions until the existing network of infrastructure and services is fully utilized? In other words, no more growth until you fix what you got. This sounds like a question to me. We got green. We've got an answer. We've got a maybe. We've got an answer. All right. So I'm going to start. Maybe. I got to look at the rules again. <laughs> Maybe meant. Maybe meant. You can't say what maybe meant. You gotta hold up an answer thing. Okay. All right. You can't be like City Hall though and go back on something. It's like, no, you hold up maybe, and maybe I didn't explain the directions enough as well. You said I get the answer if I hold up a maybe. You well, said I, automatically I get the answer. That's what you said. That's what I said, that's what I'll have to live by. Maybe. Ms. Wasilisha Lees, what do you mean by maybe? Would you allow the city to expand before you fix what we have? 
I understand the importance of actually dealing with suburban sprawl and trying to build up instead of out. But I don't think it's anyone here can give a definitive answer that there will be no uh, infrastructure built in, in, in under no circumstances when in fact we don't know whether or not there's some possibilities of working with some municipalities outside of Winnipeg to develop some sewage or sewer lines and water treatment plants to, co to cooperate in the interest of sustainability. I also don't know in fact uh, that we can, uh, we, we know everything that is being planned at City Hall right now in terms of precincts. So as we speak, and David will know this, Precinct Q, I think, was, was approved by Council this week. How many more precincts has, has the city actually approved? Do we know what they are? And can we actually definitively say we will not proceed with those proposals? So what I'm suggesting is we know we want to build up and not out. But let's do it on a planned basis, and let's do it in terms of cooperating with our neighboring municipalities as part of the greater Winnipeg region. Okay, so there's your maybe. It's a qualified answer. And I'm going to give you an extra 15 seconds because you sort of got shortchanged. Okay. Uh, with respect to the current question, the horse is already way out of the barn. In the last six months, City Council has approved all sorts of subdivisions in all the surrounding areas of the city. Whether we can slow things down, I don't know, but that's going to be first order of business because, as your question suggests, the cost, not only to the city, but to the province and to everyone else, for suburban sprawl is, is very large. Uh, and this is not the time for us to look for additional commitments because City Council is going to face a huge budget problem as soon as one of us is in office. The 2015 budget right now looks like it's $100 million short. And it's going to require some really excellent imagination and creativity on the part of the whole of the city, the council, and those who have been participating in the budget process to find a consensus of opinion in the city as to how, what we do and how we do it in the spring. And then, of course, looking forward. Uh, so, Will I commit to ensuring that the city adopts a policy of refusing further extensions? Yes, but what are we going to do about the funds that have just been approved? So uh, it's easy to say no more because just about everything has been approved. And we're going to have to deal with how we hold back on that. The other thing that I wanted to answer with regard to the question of engagement, uh, in my view, this is not something that you appoint a small group of people to take care of. It is a whole way of doing business at the city where people know that everything is public unless it should be confidential, where people answer the phone, where we have a phone directory so we don't go through with one, two, three, one, one, and where it's understood that the public, it's their, our business, what happens at City Hall, and which is why I propose to actually conduct business starting in November in the council chamber all day with the public and the press present so everyone can see what we're dealing with, understand, and contribute to it. Grow 
uh, denser and as we grow up as a city, which is my key priority in this campaign. Thanks. All right, so I think we can move on to the next question, if I'm not mistaken. And I'll pay more attention to who's flashing their cards. Infrastructure and cycling. There are major health, safety, and environmental and economic benefits to increasing cycling as a major form of transportation. Bike Winnipeg has developed a full platform of strategies to enhance infrastructure. Their goal is achieving a 5% increase in cycling uh, in five years. Your question is, as mayor, will you work to make two of Bike Winnipeg's recommended projects a priority with council and endorse them as City of Winnipeg priorities for intergovernmental funding through the Building Canada Fund. And these two projects are the rehabilitation of the Osborne Street underpass and the implementation of the pedestrian and cycling strategies. So your question is, will you support those two initiatives from Bike Winnipeg? Yes, maybe, or an answer. Go. Green, green. Okay, so we have two yellows and two green, so I have a maybe. Notice that Dr. Falcon, uh, Dr. Olette is keeping all of his cards very close to his chest. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Filion. I just want to comment uh, a little bit on the article that was uh, written there about, about a month ago about, about cycling that I uh, posted to the free press. Is that I want to expand the bicycle infrastructure here in the city. And what I do want to implement is licensing for bicycles and also the riders. With that money, it will pay for the infrastructure, no problem. Thank you. Fair enough. The next Sean, question is Sean. about housing, and I know this is of a great concern to a number of people in this room. The City of Calgary is supporting the development of 8,500 affordable houses, in Saskatoon, 5,000. The City of Winnipeg's housing policy commits to 75 affordable rental houses for the next five years. <laughs> Will you commit to providing the city city support to the same units the province of Manitoba will support? Uh, third, the province of Manitoba will support 350 units of affordable housing and 350 units of social housing over three years. So, will you match? I'm assuming from this question, the same number of units the province is going to do over the next three years. That's 350 of rental housing and 350 of social housing. For a total of seven. So that's green, 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 yes. It's a consensus here. So. <laughs> but as a moderator, I can say something, and I must say that the question is 700 units. Very much, is it? Saskatchewan is beating us. Saskatoon is beating us by, in my math, a lot. <laughs> yes, plus. There you go, one candidate says well, he would go a step further. Sean, would you please ask the responders to stand? They are heard so much better. You notice Mr. Bowman stands and yeah, uses the microphone. We need to hear everybody. Thanks, Shane. Community centers. The General Council of Winnipeg Community Centers oversees member, member community centers in Winnipeg and defines them as providing recreation programs and services to area residents through cooperative partnerships. Yet, women's resource centers, which provide programming and services to the public that foster inclusivity and address neighborhood issues, are limited in their ability for city funding. Would you support expanding the definition of community centers so resource centers and other places where neighborhood issues are addressed can apply for city funding? So, will you expand the definition of a community center to meet the needs of the community? I think that's a good paraphrase. Green, green, green. And Miss Washington Alicia Lees has an answer, and so does Zeph. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. So, Judy, what do you think? Where's that? Where's that microphone? <laughs> I absolutely understand the uh, the diverse needs of our communities. You're living in one. You're you're in a community center that has reached out to the community, provides kitchen uh, kitchen classes, cooking classes, and reaches out in a number of other ways. However, the city as a whole is barely able to support its community centers. 
they're stretched to the limit, they're all run by volunteers, there needs to be some support from the city council for our existing community centers, number one. Number two, in the, in, in, as we work to support community centers, we can incorporate the kinds of ideas that you have brought forward here, which are include uh, literacy training, um, education programs, safety uh, uh, refuge from, from the streets, all kinds of needs in our community, to work with our community centers to broaden their programming. But at this point, it would be absolutely foolish for any one of us to suggest that we could actually uh, supplement and add to our community centers with new resource centers in, given the existing financial situation at City Hall. You also need to recognize, and everyone here does, that the, that the city is now facing incredible uh, pressures because of downward pressures and offloading from the federal to the provincial to the city governments. We are now talking about issues and areas for which there is absolute provincial jurisdiction, and I would suggest to you what we all should be doing is fighting like crazy to demand that the provincial government support women's resource centers to provide 24-hour uh, refuge for, for girls and women to ensure that there is a place for young uh, adults to go in, in uh, for recreation and any other uh, kind of creative opportunities they want to pursue. So that's the, that's the reality we're facing and, uh, and I think we can work together to find a way to actually achieve the goals in this question without necessarily making an unrealistic commitment to suddenly fund uh, you know, a, a whole other level of centre uh, that falls under provincial or federal jurisdiction.
consider city policy and programming for its impact on poverty. The last opinion poll found poverty and homelessness was the fifth most important issue in Winnipeg. Would you establish the establish would you support the establishment of a poverty reduction committee of city council to develop poverty reduction strategies, be active leaders and contributors to reducing poverty in Winnipeg? So would you establish a poverty reduction committee at City Hall alongside infrastructure, alongside police? What do you say? No? And answer? Yes, yes, yes. So I'll start with you, Mr. Saunders, and answer. That's your second one. Sure. Uh, I wanted to say, sorry? Please, yes. I wanted to say yes, but I wanted to say more than yes. <laughs> because this is a kind of, there are two things, housing and poverty which city councilors have traditionally said is not their business. And that it's the responsibility of the federal and provincial governments. And I don't agree with that. And I believe that the city council, city of Winnipeg, are representatives of the interests of all citizens of Winnipeg, and especially those who don't have affordable housing, especially those who are living in poverty, children who are not eating, uh, who don't have good care. And so I do believe the city of Winnipeg and the council and the administration have a responsibility to advocate and lead and provide whatever services and support we can. And there's a whole range of things we can do. So yes, but a, a really big yes for me. Thank you. I said no because not because I don't think it's uh, the responsibility of the city to be involved in poverty reduction. On the contrary, it, be, it is because I believe the city has an important role to actually pay attention to the serious gap between the rich and the poor and, uh, and, and between women and men in all of our communities. I want to suggest to you that establishing another committee of council is only going to be window dressing and obfuscation and passing the buck. I would suggest to you that and, and there's lots of poverty reduction committees and organizations all involved in this. I think the way we have to approach it is for us to actually elevate it to the highest level of intergovernmental uh, involvement. And I would suggest there has to be a committee or, or a, a body made up of the mayor, the premier, and the senior regional minister for the federal government to sit down and start talking seriously about the, the depths of poverty in the city and to recognize that uh, the definition of a vibrant city means reducing the human, economic, and social costs of poverty. That ends the list of prepared questions that was given uh, for the candidates. And now we're going to turn to what is on your minds. And but the answer slips that you, some of you have husbanded so close to your chest. <laughs> Dr. Olet's got three chances. Gives you a chance to rebut. So the questions will come from the audience, and they'll be directed at each candidate as we go. But if you feel compelled that you want to respond after one of your co-candidates has made a statement, then you can use one of your chits to get in, into the game. So, here we go. These are coming, they're written down. And I, and I think we'll, we'll just start with Mr. Bowman and we'll work our way this way. The Forks authorities are planning uh, to use up the last of the vacant land for private housing. Do you agree or disagree with this proposal. Forks authorities are planning to use the last of the vacant land, I believe they're talking about parcel four, yeah. for private housing. So you're talking about the, uh, the, the existing plans that went through the public consultation, the rail side parcel four development. That's right, so this is adjacent yeah. to the ballpark and across from yeah. the Human Rights Museum. It's a very controversial <coughs> place where Mayor Cates wanted to put a water park. I will not be putting a water park there. I do like the idea. I made a commitment to increasing downtown resident numbers by one-third over the next four years, 
and uh, from 15,000, about 15,000 up to 20,000. A big component of that is getting more housing in that space. I'd like to see more people living and enjoying downtown. I think the best way to have a safer downtown is more feet on the ground than drones in the sky. It's a, it's a simple way to get people there and it's a great place. What I've gone further is that, that I'd like a community center there, ideally even with the daycare, so that families have that option of living downtown with greater amenities than they have right now. Thanks. And Mr. Curiel will, will uh, use one of his answer cards and, uh, and respond. So what would you do with parcel four? Would you allow private housing? No, I would not. Because no, it's not the room for that, isn't it? Okay, it's not the area for that, it's not the room for that. Is that we have to think of history, what the forest was all about. It was about a meeting, meeting place, it wasn't for residential. And we have to keep on with the tradition. What I propose with Parcel 4, especially in front of the Canada uh, uh, Museum of Human Rights, is a theatre, which is explained on my YouTube channel in Chapter 7. It would be a theatre for tourists. It would be a show that would be, uh, how would I say, it would be a year of the show changed once a year. And I would like it to be designed by the Aboriginal community since they were the First Nations in this country. That's what I would do. Thank you. So the next question, um, and it's a, it's a fascinating one, and it's a big, big question for the city of Winnipeg. Winnipegers get their water from Shoal Lake. How will you ensure the First Nations people's rights, and that's Shoal Lake 39 and 40, are respected? Are you open to negotiation for an equitable solution? And I'll ask you, Mr. Filial, because you're actually coming down the way, it's, it's, it's your question to answer. Would you negotiate with uh, the First Nations on Shoal Lake for their water and changes that we might make to agreements that we already I would have? negotiate with them, yes, of course. But ultimately, that is not really the solution. What do you think is growing as far as not published? We all know that. And I was talking with one of the heads at the uh, Water Utility Board, and that was quite a few years ago, and he said to me that it's ultimately important for the citizens of Winnipeg to realize that we do need a second water source. So we cannot depend on Shoal Lake for the remainder of our lives. It won't happen. It won't suffice our needs. So to seriously think of a second water source, and my brother, which is the mayor of St. Pierre, they are going to be experimenting with a European model, which I will be phoning in from time to time to see how that model is working, and if it works, then adopting it to our city. Thanks. The next question, and it will go to Dr. Rolat. Would you accept having constables trained in mental health to help services in Winnipeg. <coughs> Did I get that question right? Close enough. Yep. Close enough? Service Winnipeg? An interesting question. Um, <coughs> at the end of the day, I think we already have the police force we need. I don't think we need more police officers. Um, I think we also have the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority, which has those appropriate services. And so what I would like to see is more coordination between those two bodies, working together between the province, and ensuring that, in fact, what actually occurs is that people get the appropriate resources when they start entering the system so it doesn't cause a snowball effect over time where we're having to keep going back to the same individuals over and over again, uh, which are, is very taxing on the system and very taxing on our uh, tax system as well. And so, the short answer, no. No. It's a, it's a big question for police officers. Uh, journalists work with police officers all the time, and they struggle with a great deal of mental health issues all the time. And but, you know, this, I, will, I will say, though, like one of the problems I think with the police force today is they actually don't receive enough training throughout the rest of their career, and there's not enough support for police officers as they go on through other careers. So, often what we have is police officers who enter the police service with a certain level of education, and they have to, in their own time, find the ability to perhaps increase that education. So if they only have a high school diploma, it's very hard for them to then get that, that level, perhaps that understanding they might need to be dealing with all the social issues that they have in front of them. So there is a need to be doing continuous training or some continue for those people. So I would contribute for respectfully something like that. 
This next question is poignant for me. The 94-year-old lady that lived next door to me walked everywhere, took care of her garden. We were in the last election, and she stopped me at the fence, and she said, I can't get to the bus because I trip on the sidewalks. You go ask those candidates. And I asked them some similar question. What will be done to ensure that our sidewalks are even and not eroded so that persons with disabilities and the elderly have a safe and secure walking path? So this question is to you, Mr. Saunders. What would you do to make sure that the sidewalks are safe? The most important thing is to understand that this is a first priority, not a last priority. For example, when we have snow and ice, the first thing that should be sanded should be the sidewalks for those who need to walk to the bus shelter. Uh, otherwise, people are captives in their homes. Uh, first place to be uh, snow to be plowed. The curbs and the sidewalks access advisory committee has been attempting to direct the city to do. And the important thing is to ensure that the council asks for the administration to present a budget and proposals to actually take care of this work as opposed to hoping that it happens. And it means that the council is going to have to pay close attention to ensure that it happens and to listen to the people in the community expressing their concerns and pointing out where things are not working. Uh, to realize, and of course a lot of us are getting old, that uh, this applies to a very large population of the city of Winnipeg. It's a very important issue. First one? Yeah. First one. Husband and Tilly Garian. So one of the issues in, I think, in the sidewalks that we've seen is the lack of snow removal. Where are we going to get the money? Uh, you know, Mr. Sander, Saunders here mentioned that we have a budgetary deficit from $70 million to $100 million. And so what I've found is I'm going to be putting in place a land value tax in the downtown core on those service parking lots, taxing them as if they were four-story parking lots in order to do a mill differential rate to get more revenue for the city. And I'm going to generate about $26 million in revenue from that. Now, what I'm going to do with that money is $10 million is going to go towards snow removal actually getting the proper equipment to do that job properly. Because I don't think we have the actual equipment we need in industrial snowblowers, ensuring that we're actually removing the snow in a timely manner, and not people are showing up with front-end loaders, which are very, very inefficient, and actually ensuring that some of our workers have the proper training, and they actually know what they should be doing when they're doing it. So this is what I'm committing to. Not only is it realistic, I have the money, but it's something that's done in other jurisdictions in Canada who have deal with much more snow than we have here in Winnipeg. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to hold off on one question. We're going to go back to the format, get your yes, no, or maybes out. I want a quick question on, a quick answer on this. If you're mayor, will you commit to continue to clean the sidewalks? Because some cities don't do it, and I'd like to know, and I'll be around to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> will you commit? Just put it up, just hold it up. You will, with an answer, Mr. Bowman. Wow. Step into this one, Mr. Bowman. I'd like to hear what you have to say. I, I, I was born on Logan Avenue, but I was raised in Charleswood. I'd like all communities eventually to have sidewalks. We have ditches in Charleswood. We don't have sidewalks. And many of my, many of my neighbors who are elderly, who do walk quite often to stay in shape, and they do a great job. They're dodging traffic, <coughs> and in other, and that's in other areas of the city as well. So I'd like to see first. I'd like to see sidewalks, but of course, I'd like to see the snow removal. I got you, I got you down to the snow removal. Yeah, you do. All right. Yeah. Winnipeg is dealing with a high level of homelessness. Rooming houses are an option that has a potential to provide affordable, more stable housing than one night stand shelters and beds. A lot of car, uh, what they call couch surfing going on. How do you plan to deal with homelessness in Winnipeg? Judy, jump your press conference for tomorrow and yes. tell us what you're going to do. <laughs> Stay tuned. Tomorrow at 10 a.m. No, I will, you don't, I'll tell you now. Um, I absolutely, oops. Hello. Hello. 
Yes, Sean is right. I'm having a press conference tomorrow on a housing and homelessness strategy, and it will be comprehensive and complete to deal not only with the question of uh, of how we assist people who are find themselves in a in a in a cycle of dependency and uh, without assistance to, to find shelter uh, on a permanent basis. It will also deal with the fact that uh, we the 350 uh, you mentioned earlier is inadequate, and we need a much bigger uh, a much bigger um, program on the part of the city. We can do that through the use of TIF, the Tax Increment Financing Plan. We can do that in terms of inclusionary zoning. We can do that in terms of, of uh, setting aside land that the city actually owns and, and controls and putting it in the, in the, in the purview of uh, people who want to develop affordable mixed-use housing. You mentioned the forks earlier. I, I didn't answer on that question, but I do know it's not simply about private housing. It is an attempt to bring mixed-use affordable housing downtown. So I'll, I'll put that out on the table without getting into the argument. But I will say, in terms of ha homeless people, where where we have to st we have to stop this idea that some candidates have suggested of getting them out of sight and out of mind. Just drive, you know, bring the vans in downtown and scoop them up and get them out of our way. Instead, I think we need to actually follow the advice of Downtown Biz and other organizations who have said we need to be hands on the street, we need to be there offering support and services, we need to offer the, the counseling in terms, or, or at least direct them to uh, mental health counseling and addiction services. One of the programs that I've been volunteering with, I uh, had to take a leave from the board because of running, is Red Road Lodge, an organization that believes in providing a roof over one's head, a shelter, but more than that, tying it to actually getting assistance with mental health issues, with addiction counseling, and employment and training. And you will know from Red Bull Lodge, incredible artists are coming out of that program and starting to sell their, their artistry and make a living because of that uh, uh, hands up and help that they were given to that program. That's what the city needs to do more of. I don't need a microphone. Um, one of the biggest concerns with every mayor all across this country is financing your cities. We all know our society has changed from a rural to an urban uh, population, and the tax structure does not favor cities. What are, I've not heard anything in the campaign, except for just right now, about taxing the, the parking lots. But we need more money in the hands of our municipal government. I think we all agree on that. What do you guys have to say about how we're going to effectively get more of the uh, defined, uh, predictable income into the hands of our municipal leaders? Stand up. 
Okay, for me, I don't know if you're, if you're aware, but my number one goal in my campaign, my, my, my number one topic is to fix the roads, and that includes the sidewalks and boulevards. And when we're talking about financing, we're talking about the whole city, in fact, we're talking about what I plan to do in 10 years. We need an awful lot of money. I mean, I'm looking at about $300 million a year. So how are we going to finance this? You can ask me that. I have four things. Is that first thing would be a 10% increase in property taxes within two years. After that, there will be a study on how much money we have collected from other funds, and if we need to continue that, then we have to continue that. <coughs> Second of all would be a payroll tax for the people that live out of town, that work in the city, and use our city services. If it would be business owners, then it would be through the property tax. Third of all would be a one cent gasoline increase, one cent gasoline tax. And fourth of all, which that is a maybe, okay, would be to get our fair share of the provincial tax hike, which Mr. Selinger is still pulling away, but I think with, I can convince him to do it otherwise. <laughs> Judy, what do you think? More money. Mr. Steve says there is no way we're going to get it from the province, no how. And Mr. Steves also says he's not going to actually increase property taxes. <laughs> and, uh, and we know what, what the state of affairs is after 10 years of property tax freezes. We, had, uh, we, have a, we have an infrastructure deficit that is getting close to $8 billion. We have, the, as we just heard, the real problems in terms of snow removal and, uh, and responding in, in cases of, of emergency like frozen pipes, even if it's beyond our control. So, what I have said is the first thing that has to happen is the city needs to get its house in order. And we have to, in fact, uh, do what, is, what, what I think everyone in this room agrees with, is that each do our part. And an affordable, predictable property tax increase based on cost of living and, uh, in, and population growth is the appropriate way to go. And then for the city to use that money to invest wisely, in fact, to take a portion of that increase to pay for borrowing so we can actually take a bigger bite out of inf our infrastructure deficit. So my proposal, although it's still a long way from achieving what we all want, which is the elimination of the infrastructure deficit and the provision of services that everyone wants, is, is will lead to $400 billion over four years. I also know that once we get our house in order, we have, we're on much better ground to go to the provincial and federal governments and demand partnerships on the on the issues that are, are, are overwhelming cities right across this country. You will recall back in what, 2004, before that, Glen Murray's focus on the New Deal. The New Deal is still a relevant issue. It's still not been addressed. The, the Federation of Council of Municipalities, the first, uh, the, the big mayors, uh, the city, blah, 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 the mayors of the big cities have been discussing this and fighting and lobbying for it forever and still no progress. So I think Winnipeg, by getting its house in order and doing proper fiscal management and proper planning, then has the legitimacy to go forward and be a, a major force, a big voice uh, at the federal and provincial table. Uh, my name is Josh Sigurdsson, I'm from Winnipeg Alternative Media, and uh, many of you, or whoever wins this election, will be hearing a lot from us, unfortunately, maybe for you. But um, I wanted to ask a key question that many, many Winnipeggers have been coming out in droves to support, which is the end of the fluoridation of our water with the um, byproduct of aluminum, which is considered toxic waste, hydrofluoral silicic acid. It's that actual industrial grade fluoride that we don't have this kind of stuff in our toothpaste. We have medical grade fluoride in our toothpaste. This is hydrofluoral silicic acid and is considered forced medication. And I know Mr. Saunders has been uh, has worked with uh, water and everything like that in the past. I want to know which one of you would support listening to the people and finally taking the fluoridation out of our tap water. This question is to you because we're coming down the line. So. Uh, what do you think? Would you remove fluoride from the water? Wow, a very uh, interesting question. Uh, first time it's come up in the campaign. Thank you very much. Um, it's not really in my policies or any of my proposals. I mean, we haven't looked at it. 
uh, I hadn't taken the time in order to consider it. I know in my, me and my wife, we've talked about it a, a number of times. I've lived in some cities that have done fluoridation uh, and, and have removed it and then put it back on the ballot. Uh, for instance, in Calgary in the 1980s, it was a huge debate. You were in Calgary. Yeah. And you actually apologize to the newspapers to the citizens for it. Yes, I know. But uh, it's just not been part of my policies because I think there's so many other issues that are that have to be dealt with here at City Hall and in the City of Winnipeg. There's things that, at the end of the day, we really need to be discussing the infrastructure, how we're actually funding cities, how we're actually doing city planning, the role of developers. Okay, so we can't get into a debate here. We have lots of questions. So it's just, you know, even public transportation, like all those things, I think, for me, were, have a higher level of priority to discuss than rather discussing fluoridation. I'm sorry. specifically asked the head of transit if a ridership study had been done. His answer was, and he didn't lie, his answer was, we think there will be a 10% increase. In other words, there has been no study has been done. Isn't this exactly the same thing as happened with the fire stations? Somebody said, we think it's a good idea to have fire stations that, that are not on our property. Is this not exactly the same thing as the um, as, as the uh, land transfers and all the other stuff that's been happening? Bureaucrats say, we think. Now my question to you is, will you stop this we think culture and really start to do the studies, especially the study for mass transit that needs to be done in order to ensure a successful mass transit? I'm going to add to that. So answer the question directly and also ask, tell us your confidence in the phase two of rapid transit because I've asked the head of transit those questions and he hasn't been able to provide those, that, those statistics. So, Well, first of all, let's acknowledge that mass transit is absolutely necessary for a city the size of Winnipeg. 
uh, if we want to deal with traffic congestion, if we want to deal with reducing our carbon footprint, if we want to be a modern metropolitan city, rapid transit of some form is absolutely necessary. We have a half-built transit way. Uh, I've committed to completing that transit way. I believe that BRT plus rapid transit has been studied and it is effective. I spent a lot of time in Ottawa. BRT works well and it would be an appropriate uh, methodology for our city. This this, plan? Have you I'm at coming it? to that. So in terms of BRT plus rapid transit, I think it's been studied and it's proven effective. And if anybody's taken the, the 3.6 kilometers on the BRT uh, and before you uh, blink, it's over, but it's wonderful. Right. Um, so, well, I, I've taken it, and I think uh, I think it is. But here's the here's the concern. What has actually? How much confidence can we have in the plan that was passed by council without any budgetary allocation? So I don't want to hold up this project because we've been through this for 14 years. Remember, Glen Burris started it. Sam Cates cancelled it. Then we put went through humming and hawing, and then we talked about referendum, and now we finally have a proposal, and we're revisiting it again. So I'm really worried about slowing this down once more, and Winnipeg being set back another decade without any kind of rapid transit. But I have enough concerns about the fact that the numbers, uh, the the proposal jumped uh, from, by 200 million dollars in the space of 18 months. I don't have an explanation for that. And so I have said immediately upon my election as mayor of the city, I will ensure that there is a fast, thorough review of that particular uh, uh, transit route and the monies that have been uh, set aside for it to ensure that we aren't, uh, aren't going down a path of uncertainty that will not succeed. I want to make it work because in fact there are three other lines in the works that need to go ahead. We already have planning to go out to Transcona. There's, there's the next line is to the north end and then of course to the west end. So we need to get on with this task. We can't do it unless we finish the southwest transit corridor and, uh, and, uh, and, and prove to Winnipeg's that rapid transit will make a difference. So we're going to go ahead with it if duty is here. Dr. has used like this uh, valuable answer Things, and he's going to jump in here. Rapid transit, the plan itself, and the culture of this gentleman's describing a culture where studies are done, but they don't really answer any of the questions, and then the plans go ahead anyway. Yeah, I'd like to comment on the BRT. Uh, what what happened actually in Ottawa is they're actually moving away from the BRT because they found that the purported they're actually moving away from it. They're going towards an LRT system because they found the purported benefits of higher density just did not occur. And so what I'm actually proposing is something completely different, something that's used in Quebec City, understanding other jurisdictions, what they have done. In Quebec City, what they put in place was the metro bus system. In 1996, they saw a 5% increase in ridership once they reorganized their entire bus system in, in trying to do something completely different, creating two accesses so it can benefit all citizens throughout the entire city, so from the north to the south, from the east to the west, having the, the rest of the buses hooked up into that system so that you only stand outside waiting for 5 to 12 minutes for a bus to show up instead of an hour and 15 minutes doubling services along the bus line, really that's not making anything much more efficient. And the efficiency rapidity of a bus is not about how fast it's going, it's actually supposed to be about the number of buses coming. Now, that is just phase one of my plan. Phase two is actually conducting a study of rail relocation in the city, paid for 50% by the federal government, $1.5 million conducted by the Social Planning Council of Winnipeg, who have already done quite a bit of the legwork on this. Then, once that is done, then actually moving the rails outside of the city, and there's a, a little diagram over here where you can actually see this, and I brought this along with me today. And once you've done that, all of a sudden you have all this open infrastructure within the city of Winnipeg these rail lines, and what you do is you then take that, you convert it to LRT, it's the same gauge, and all of a sudden you have a mass transit modern system for a city of a million people. This is what we call long-term vision. This is what we call city planning for thinking 20, 30 years down the line. And this is what, as a scientist, a social scientist, looking at the city of Winnipeg, I say, this is what Winnipeg needs to do. Bravo! Really quickly, the reason we use buses 
is because they're flexible. You don't imprison a bus in its own infrastructure. You have buses because you can move them about where populations live, where they want to go, and who actually needs it. The, the bus system we're building in the south of the city doesn't benefit the people here who need to get to the University of Manitoba to take the nursing programs. It doesn't benefit the people in Transcona. It doesn't benefit anyone except for a small segment of the population. And this is what we're talking about city planning, how we actually make a city that benefits everyone. Yes. And so to answer that question, I, I didn't get a chance to answer it, I would be discussing with them 
uh, renegotiation. I would be talking about how we can make this long-term relationship work better. I would also want to look for alternate water sources, but ultimately it does come down to respect. And uh, that's how we've gotten things done that have built this city to a wonderful place it is. Winnipeg works at its best when we're dealing at a level of respect. And that's ultimately what it's going to come down to on that issue and so many others. Thank you. Maybe, maybe we'll get uh, Judy to, to weigh in on this. So, so thank, you, thank you. I think actually um, <coughs> Diane Redskind took another tr uh, group to Shoal Lake today. Um, she's been uh, trying to get us all to experience firsthand the, the complexity of this issue. And I do want to make that voyage, and I do want to learn more. But as I understand it, uh, there is a question now of the cities um, uh, being at the table with goodwill and respect. And in fact, is the negligent partner, in, in, along with the federal government, I believe, in terms of agreeing to a road, the road that needs to be built between the to, to access the community. That's, that's a big part of the issue. The way in which, so Shoal Lake and, the, and our indigenous communities um, allowing us to use the water all these years and then the city um, not returning. Um, it's uh, part of the bargain by, by improving the conditions and access to that community. So much to learn and I think there needs to be a new, a new uh, uh, partnership uh, with the city uh, once the election is over. I've made the suggestion, in fact, that on Indigenous issues in general, uh, we need to actually start again. We need to actually develop a new relationship, a new beginning with our Indigenous uh, peoples. And uh, the way that's, the way I've suggested we do that is modeling or copying the Thompson Accord and to sit down as, as partners with the Indigenous community and drawing up a written agreement for how we go forward on this and many other issues. Good question. Very quickly, David. And we got a one. Just very quickly, uh, 35 years ago, I did on behalf of the province negotiate with Band 40 with regard to the water supply. And when I met with them and I understood their perspective, I ended up attempting to negotiate with the province and the city to respect and follow their wishes. And I know that at the time there was a, a deal finally done with the federal government which worked for a time, but it wasn't a good one. And I would look forward to working again with the community as I did before. I've been there, I know what the situation is, and I do believe there are solutions which work for all the communities involved, not only the Band 40 and 39A, but also Winnipeg and the other capital region municipalities as well. So thank you for the question. This is a very serious question, and one which the city of Winnipeg is, is not in the driver's seat. Please, go ahead. Okay, um, ma'am, 
I'd like to talk about... Stand up. <laughs> okay, it's a strange kind of email that I got the other day, and I'm sure the other candidates have the same email, but no one ever talks about this, because it deals with a group of women that people think that they're absolutely nothing, you know? and that is prostitutes, you know? and the safety of them. And I wrote a letter to the association, and it's regarding the bill that the uh, federal government wants to pass through. And actually, if that bill passes through, it'll make the situation even worse. The thing is, but with that issue, that how it always been the city's responsibility, it always has been held in the municipal kind of laws, if you want to call it. It has never been really held by the federal government. And I always say, like Pierre Trudeau, the government has no business in people's bedrooms, okay? And for me, I would like to extend paid or unpaid. Okay? And I would like to introduce the old thing, you know, about brothels. And again, that would be to ensure safety to these women. Whether you agree with the profession or not, that is not the issue. The issue is safety. And we have to keep all our citizens safe. And that is part of our society. Thank you. Okay. You know, this is a hot topic today uh, in the news media. Uh, Councillor Vandell has brought a motion to City Council for the city to represent whether they would like a, a, an inquiry into missing and murdered women. And if you could just, we don't need to, as a show of hands, would you support Councillor Vandell's motion today to have the city ask the federal government for an inquiry on missing and murdered women? So there you have it. Okay, well, no, listen, I'd like to hear what your, what your answer is. And Marty, we'll get to you, or I'll never get out of here alive. <laughs> As I mentioned before, strips on. There we go. Um, as I mentioned before, I've done some work with uh, an organization called Gandhi Gennachuk, and uh, Gandhi's position was not to support a national inquiry, um, mainly because the view of the organization was that uh, we wanted the money to flow to organizations to deal with, you know, not another study. And and there is, there's a lot of division within our Indigenous community and within the population, broadly speaking, on this issue. Um, I'm, I'm open to it, but for me, I just want to focus on what can Winnipeg do better to deal with the issue that you specifically asked. And, and that's something that should fall, even though uh, some of these issues overlap with other levels of government, we've seen politicians for many, many years use it as an excuse to do not, nothing at all. And we do need to take this personal. Uh, these are our girls, these are our women that have gone missing and murdered. Whether you're Aboriginal or not, you should take it very personal. And so uh, one, of, one of the things that, that, that I would want to do is, sorry, one of the things that I would want to do is just focus on getting more people, uh, more people downtown and in other areas of the city by increasing density so there's more eyeballs on the street. Because that is a really big deal when it comes to, to safety. The other issue that we were asked earlier, which is on extending, uh, extending the designation of community centers to other organizations. Part of the reason why I said yes is because of some of the organizations that I visited before and during this campaign that are helping women and are helping them in a very real and meaningful way. And yeah, it's going to cost money. But why else does government exist to help people? And these are the people that need it most. And so we have to take it personal and we have to make sure that we're actually dealing with the issues rather than just dealing with, with rhetoric during election time. So thank you so much for the question. Sorry about that. But if Marty doesn't ask his question, he's going to storm over here. Thank you. I apologize for interrupting you. This is an important question. There are two issues that other cities have taken on. One is a fair wage city where you do not contract, pay your employees, or, or, put, put, or obtain services from anybody who pays less than $15 an hour. And I'm wondering whether Winnipeg could declare itself a fair wage city. That's number one. Number two is in any new development, there must be a certain percentage of rent geared to income accommodation. And it, it, this be legislated and enforced. And I'm wondering where you stand on either of these issues. So 
yes to the fair wage. I believe it's uh, human rights and human dignity. So if people can't support their own families, then I don't know what it's like to grow up in poverty, uh, extreme poverty, and when your parents can't support their families, it's absolutely a terrible thing. It causes mental illness and all sorts of social issues. Um, now related to, the second question was, oh, social housing and affordable housing. In fact, what they're doing in development. So requirements, yes. Right. Yeah, what, uh, let's take Waverly West. The province decided that they were going to build a brand new eco neighborhood uh, with uh, geothermal and walkable neighborhood. But there's nothing walkable about it. There's no schools there. You can walk to a store, and you can't even do the possible popsicle test where a child walks to the store, buys a popsicle, walk home in the same time before it melts. And so what have we created? We've created essentially a neighborhood, a ghetto, for people who have higher income. And I think this is actually one of the worst things that we've been doing in this city. And if you really want to build a united city, we actually have to start mixing more together. So those, those neighborhoods need to have social housing within them. High density as well, but also behind, beside, the half million, beside the half million dollar house, you also need to have a, a house which is a duplex with a low income families, affordable housing for young people who can start to buy into the market. You need to start mixing people. And this is actually makes neighborhoods much safer. If we have safe, it makes also, you, it makes it healthier for you. Because not only are you mixing with people of your same social class, you're actually getting an understanding of what it's like for other people. And your neighbors might say, well, what are you doing today? Well, you know, I'm going to work. Oh, wonderful. Uh, what are you doing today? Oh, my child's off to college. Well, maybe my children should go off to university or college. And there's this great, this benefit that starts happening. How could, you know, have you ever, uh, you need a f help fixing your home. How can I help you with that? Have you ever done that before? Because a lot of people I know growing up, I never lived in a home, and the first time I ever lived in a home, it was terrible because we had no idea what to do with it. We had no idea to how even to use a hammer, and we had to spend an inordinate amount of our money trying to get a workman in to show us what to do. And so those things, you can rely on your neighbors, and this is why Winnipeg is called, you know, Friendly Manitoba. You have those great neighborhoods, and we start needing to mix them together. show me yes, no on Marty's first question on an equitable wage in the city of Winnipeg. Just where do you stand? Would you, would you support that or maybe or not? But I'm not asking you for a rebut. So just put up your cards. What do you think? You yes, yes. Maybe. Yes, you vote. Maven, Brian, maybe. Okay, so there you go, Marty. You get some sense of consent. Over here. Clark. Yes. Um, we've been talking about affordable housing and mixed neighborhoods. And there is a tool called inclusionary zoning that you probably know about. That's where in order to do a development, a developer will have to agree that a certain number of the units would have to be affordable or social. This, this is a tool that's available to uh, the city of Winnipeg right now. The province has made it available to any municipality that wants to. Would you, as mayor, be prepared to use this tool in order to develop the kinds of communities you've been talking about tonight? Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. City Council just adopted a, a rental program for downtown Winnipeg with tax incentives for 20 years on the condition that 10% be affordable. So by definition, 90% will be unaffordable housing. That is not my record. We would reverse, well not, we wouldn't reverse it, but you would have certainly a different mixture and to use that throughout the city, really. I, I would add something which I, I learned recently. I was familiar with Kinu Housing Corporation and their role in the city. And when I was last involved with uh, their uh, properties, they had some like 400 homes throughout the city. And now it's apparently over 1,000 homes throughout the city. And I think that's a wonderful thing that's happening. Yes, and it's in my press release tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. We're getting all the news today tomorrow. So I think this will be the last question. So we leave time for the uh, for uh, each candidate to wrap up and um, and a uh, time to sort of wrap everything up at the end. And uh, so I know tons of people have questions and, and we're.
really excited. I, I encourage all of you to get in contact with the candidates personally. Um, I know I've sent uh, probably about a hundred emails to them and planning this, so um, they generally respond. So, <laughs> so I'm sure you can do the same. But this is the last question for tonight. Uh, I don't know why the issue of water fluoridation is so easily um, put aside because we spent two hundred fifty thousand dollars in this product project. It's forced medication. You know, ninety eight percent of Europe, the province of BC, as well as Calgary, don't have fluoride in their water. Now it affects our pineal gland, our thyroid gland. It lowers the IQ in children, and this is an industrial waste byproduct being added to our water with many other toxic heavy metals as well. Now. Are you considering any other serious dental solutions instead of forcefully medicating the population? Yeah, I'm just going to ask for a show of hands. Are you, are you, would you attempt to change the fluoridation in the Winnipeg water system, as this gentleman suggests, it's dangerous? I don't, because I know that you're not prepared to answer this question because you don't know the science behind it. But off the top, maybe, maybe I'll be different. And I'll say yes. <laughs> I grew up in Calgary without it, and I know it's not, uh, it's not really needed, it's expensive. So we're going to get final statements, and each candidate is going to have two minutes to summarize their positions. I would ask all of you to rise up on the balls of your feet, and really make the case, because we all have a decision to make, and we depend a lot on you. So we'll start with Ryan and work our way back this way. Sure, two minutes. Sure. Uh, well, thank you very much for, uh, for organizing the event. Thank you very much for everybody for being here. Uh, like I said earlier, this, this election isn't just, as we can see tonight, it's not just about pipes and potholes. It's about much, much more. It's about what type of a society, what type of a city do we want to build for our children and for their children. Uh, I'm in this race. I'm running for, for office for the very first time. The reason I'm here to ask for your vote, your confidence, and your trust is because I'm ready to serve for all Winnipeggers, and I'm ready to serve for Winnipeg. Uh, I envision a city of a million people strong, and I want to build a city that welcomes people from around the world, from northern Manitoba, from all across this country. Winnipeg is a beautiful, great city, and it's time for, for a new generation of leadership to step up, get into City Hall, and try to do as good a job as possible to move our city forward. My main areas of focus are making sure City Hall works. I think the city, city works just fine. You do your part, it's time for City Hall to do its part. I see greater openness and transparency at City Hall as one of the key priorities that I'd like to bring to the table. Secondly, we need to build and focus on a growing, thriving, more modern city with modern infrastructure, including rapid transit to all areas of the city. Thirdly, we need to build stronger and safer neighborhoods. Every neighborhood, every individual has a right to feel safe and to be safe in our community. On October 22nd, I ask for your vote to help me move Winnipeg forward. Thanks very much for coming tonight. Thanks for your attention. Mr. Philly, two minutes. What my aim for the city government of the city of Winnipeg is to be the most respectable government in Canada that truly represents its people. I plan to build a new relationship with key leaders in the community of both region and people. Together with a sense of respect and love, the city will see change in the quality of life. I have both a wishbone and a backbone to attain this. Voilà quelques années, mon partenaire et moi avons visité Hiroshima au Japon. Après que nous avons visité le musée de la bombe, les guides nous avaient donné ceci, une grue pliée faite en papier. To see the histoire, the histoire vraie. In this tree, on nom de Sadako Sadaki, vivait à Hiroshima durant la Deuxième Guerre mondiale. La bombe a explosé. Elle vivait à peu près un kilomètre du centre de l'explosion. Neuf ans plus tard, elle commença à développer des bosses. Sur ses jambes, on développait des cystes violets. Elle avait la leucémie. Les médecins lui ont donné un an pour vivre. La jeune a passé son temps dans l'hôpital en pliant de l'origami des grues faites en papier. La légende indique que si l'on plie mille de ces grues, une personne recevra le cadeau des dieux. Naturellement, pour elle, le cadeau était de vivre. Elle a plié 644 grues. Malheureusement, elle était trop faible pour en plier d'autres. 
Elle est morte le 25 octobre 1955. Pour les funérailles, la famille a complété le mille pour elle et les mille ont été enterrés avec elle. Une statue de Sadako que j'ai vue devant mes yeux a été érigée à ce musée en 1958. Elle tient une de ses plus dans ses mains. Chaque année, il y a une célébration devant cette statue sur la journée de bon. Des milliers de personnes posent au pied de la statue ces oiseaux fait en papier. Le scénario était très émouvant. There is a lesson to be learned from the story that never to lose hope, even in dire situations. Our city needs fixing in several different ways. Some of them are not even mentioned in my campaign, but we will start with this. My partner mentioned to me that I use the term love too much in my campaign. I love you. I told him, without the mayor loving its citizens, and without its citizens loving their mayor, nothing would be attainable, nothing will happen. Love is the start, and we will build from there. Dire situations will fade and eventually disappear. The quality of life will augment. My city is your city. My journey is your journey, body and soul. Thank you. So thank you very much for having me here tonight. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak. At the foundation of all great cities, good, great, mid-sized cities, not New York or London or even Toronto, is the ideal of good city planning. City planning based on a long-term vision. The city of Calgary plans for a hundred years. Here in Winnipeg, we have city planning based on a crisis model. It's time to get back to something which is far more fundamental about how we actually understand the function and the role of cities. Now, I've been going down to City Hall for the past two years. I've been going down there, researching the city, trying to understand how Winnipeg thinks and how you function. The citizens are ready for that type of leadership. You are ready for something which is completely different. We have in front of you many great candidates, but there is only one who will offer something completely different to you that you actually need. There are social issues in this city that cannot be dealt with in the usual ways that we have been talking about. There are populations that need to be inspired to start participating in our body politic. There are populations that need to be engaged. And how do you go about doing that? It is not only through saying, yes, I understand, but also having someone, that inspirational leadership, who has lived it, done it, and succeeded. Succeeded in spite of all the obstacles in front of him. Succeeded and can say, yes, I have done it, and I know how you can do it too. So this is why I need your support. Because this is one of the most important elections in two generations. You have the opportunity to change the collective history of this city. You have the opportunity to do something completely different that has never been done before. We can continue down the same path. Or we can seize the destiny that was decided for us by Louis Riel about a city which was united in common cause. A city which built was built upon the ideal of it didn't matter who you are, your creed, your color, nor your religion, but that all that mattered was that you wanted to work hard and that you could build a life for yourself and your family. So thank you very much. Tapuyaki Tuam. Merci beaucoup. Salamat. Bravo.
And I believe we should keep all of our green space and certainly our golf courses as parks, zoned as parks, and green spaces we need more, not less. Thank goodness that the law requires two-thirds majority of council to dispose of parks, and there was not quite two-thirds available for that before. I'm sure come November we will not have to worry about the two-thirds majority disposing of our golf courses. <coughs> So thank you for those who asked those questions, and I think that probably everybody in front of you would agree with them. Very quickly, I'm running because I think, first of all, we do have to overhaul City Hall. The senior management and the council have been behaving in a seriously wrong way. There have been misconduct, mismanagement. In fact, a lot of the matters are now before the RCMP for investigation. I believe we need to fix decision making at City Hall in order that we can do all of the wonderful things that we'd like to see us do. And I believe that my own background and knowledge of government and the city means that I'm probably the best person to deal with this on day one. And that's what I intend to do. And when we do that, the next thing will be to deal with the first budget, which is going to be very difficult. And after that, then all of the good things, the wonderful things, which there's consensus on. You wouldn't have had consensus on these things five years ago or ten years ago. And there's progress here. Then we can begin to get on with that. And I look forward to helping make that happen. And it's nice to be back next to Torah Place. <laughs>
and you look like you care. And I'd ask you to go out and tell everybody you know to vote in October. It's important. It really is. And I don't care who you vote for. Vote. Congratulations. Have a great time.